The Kia EV9 is morbidly obese and, I would argue, therefore, something of an insult to fundamental engineering concepts such as efficiency, embodied energy and the conservation of relatively scarce planetary resources. Drive.com.au doesn't see it quite that way, however. To them, the EV9 is, quote, the future of family-friendly zero-emissions SUVs. And they've made it their hallowed car of the year. Buried in the fine print, it's the Poverty Pack EV9 Air, which is only $105,000 drive away. Family friendly. As I see it, this is one of the epic car of the year dud calls of all time. So all of a sudden I'm feeling kind of like Uma Thurman standing there in a yellow jumpsuit holding a three foot razor blade. And there's blood all over the floor, dude, but that's okay because it's not mine. It's quite a nice feeling, actually. Uma's jumpsuits are the best. I'm John Kenogan from AutoExpert.com.au, new cars cheap, Australia only, website card. I've been playing this particular game for quite a while now, and I did notice a disturbance in the force over this award, and dude... It had a very distinctive odour. Any so-called car of the year should be, must be, a beacon of excellence in respect of what it's been put here to achieve. Can we all agree on that? EVs have been put here to reduce CO2 emissions. That's pretty clear. That's what they are fundamentally being deployed to achieve. And the Kia EV9 is kind of terrible at it. Beyond terrible, actually. We, as a species, simply cannot hope to save the planet by installing in every household a preposterous 2.6 tonne SUV costing up to $130,000 with a massive six or 700 kilogram battery. That's insane. Car of the Year awards, I get it, they're intrinsically self-indulgent. An unkind person would say masturbatory. But calling an EV9, quote, the future of family-friendly zero-emissions SUVs, seems to me simply the kind of conduct you should not be doing in public, dude. Like, come on. Perhaps Drive might like to read... Uh, its own fucking news story, right there, dated August the 4th of last year, which detailed how the unqualified use of the term zero emissions in relation to EVs is abject bullshit of such an epic calibre that if a car maker does it, they will shortly risk committing an act of misleading or deceptive conduct. I would further argue that if you charge this overweight monstrosity overnight at home, kind of likely because it's got a 100 kilowatt hour battery, at least two of the three variants are 100. So even with a three phase home charger on tap, it's going to take 10 fucking hours to recharge from flat. You'll be sucking baseload power off the grid, right? Even the Povo EV9 Air with rear drive only and a 76 kilowatt hour battery, according to Redbook, will take 32 hours and 15 minutes to recharge from flat using a conventional GPO. So if you're out in the boonies in a motel or something, bring food and, of course, a good book. On the eastern seaboard of Australia, baseload power is coal-fired. We're going to crunch the numbers directly, OK? But the CO2 from that is roughly as filthy as running a Kia Sorento diesel 
per kilometre, which is also $60,000 cheaper, let's not forget, and a very nice vehicle. The EV9 you'd want, the top of the range GT line, is a 2.6 tonne black hole of CO2 emission and embodiment, which most owners will never climb out of. This is simply a fact. This video is sponsored by that really, really bright, big yellow thing in the sky. The sun, dude. Like, try to keep up. You can buy an EV if you want, that's allowed, free country, blah blah blah, but it's going to depreciate to nearly nothing in 10 to 12 years, if it lasts that long. And it's not actually that effective against climate change. But for less than 20 grand, you can get a quality rooftop solar system with a battery backup. If you've already got solar, you can just add a battery. That's dead easy too. Solar's going to slash your electricity bill, add value to your house, protect you from power failures, and the battery can store the electricity that you generate during the day and divorce you from the grid overnight for a fraction of the cost of an EV. Visit autoexpert.com.au slash solar now. I've just partnered with a leading Australian solar specialist. I've known the owners for years. They do hundreds of installations every month. They handle the whole thing, the rebate, the approvals, the bureaucracy, and they use only quality components from suppliers with good local support. In other words, the roof's not going to be leaking afterwards and you won't be emailing the help desk in China if there's some problem. They'll just sort it for you. In most cases, you're going to be up and running in a day. If you don't know a kilowatt hour from an inverter, no problem. You'll get a reliable system that'll slash your power bill at least and might even be cash flow positive. It can even make your house apocalypse proof. Not only can you get seamless blackout protection, the solar array can continue to charge the battery when the power is out. That'll keep you going for days. Extreme weather events and grid instability, that's just how the future's gonna be. This is protection against that, and it's easy to do at a fraction of the cost of an EV. Nobody likes paying for electricity, I get that, and it's never gonna get cheaper. This is how you divorce yourself from that upward spiral, as well as burning the coal that goes with it. Coal is, of course, the biggest source of CO2 emission in Australia. Home solar is how you take effective climate action today. And unlike an EV, a good solar system with a backup battery will typically add many times its cost in value to your house. Visit autoexpert.com.au slash solar today. Just fill in the contact form and find out how simple and cost effective the right solar and battery system for your home can be. Back to that amazing Car of the Year award. Drive CEO Simon Halfhide said, Drive Car of the Year continues to be the most comprehensive Australian car awards programs designed to deliver valuable guidance for consumers on the best cars that are driving our industry forward. That's probably true, broadly. I mean, wheels is dead. They're trying to sell it, of course, but they can't because they have to keep printing it on paper, don't they? Or pay back the subscribers. And this is kind of what a publisher with his head in a frickin' vice looks like. They'd have to pay you to take it off their hands, right? It's that bad. Anyway, now, I've never met Mr. Halfhide, and God willing, I never will. This so-called valuable guidance for consumers wrapped up in this year's most comprehensive masturbatory vehicle of fantasy sort of thing included them <laughs> declaring the Sanyong Musso Ultimate XLV, I can't even say it with a straight face, the best dual cab ute under 50 grand. Imagine that. Try doing that at freaking Specsavers, dude. I double dead Dingo's Donga dare ya dude. Like, they show you all the pictures of all the utes under 50 grand. Which one looks the best to you? And you go, mm -hmm. you choose the musso. You walk out with a cane and a Labrador. Go figure.
However, if I were Mr. Half Thing as media advisor, I would A, uh, kill myself, and B, make the following point concerning less being a lot more. Let's say, hypothetically, that God herself chooses this very moment in time to make an appearance like, hey, it's been a while. She parts the clouds and struts purposefully forward across the sky, wearing Madonna's silver jumpsuit, singing like a virgin. Satan's there, a bit of a slow clap from him. He's got the dogs on a leash because, you know, rules. The gates to downstairs are unlocked, ominously foreshadowing. Flick of the wrist and God banishes all non-believers and trash talkers, drunks, womanizers, pedos, drug dealers, politicians, lawyers, economists and HR directors straight into the pit of hell where they belong. The rest of us, like, dude, we're just standing here thinking, thank fuck, I apologised sincerely last night for looking through the fence and thinking about Narelle's boobies last weekend. Dodged a real bullet there, Trev. But ask yourself this, dude. This is an important question for corporate communications, actually. What does God need to say next, or what doesn't she need to say She doesn't need to say, I am the Lord, your God, creator of the universe. I love you, but I will burn you in hell for eternity. If you think about Narelle's boobies without an adequate apology, dude. She doesn't say this because we know that already. It's explicitly there in the big Sunday book. No need to spell it all out again, right? Like, Dude, look at it another way. You meet Tom Cruise, okay? He doesn't say, I'm Tom Cruise, leading Hollywood actor, star of Mission Impossible, Top Gun, Jack Reacher, A Few Good Men, and Rain Fucking Man. He's the shit, and he knows it. So, for Mr. Halfthinger to deem it somehow necessary to qualify the relevance of their bullshit award, that's a fail, in my view. Either your bullshit award is a thing and it's got cred, or it's not and it doesn't. But if you feel the need to explain it, like, dude, that just speaks volumes. Volumes of insignificance. Just do what God and or Tom would do. Pretend everyone already believes that you're really, really important. This year, Drive judges reviewed and tested over 400 new models that went on sale during 2023 to select the overall winner, the Kia EV9, from a finalist list of 18 category winners aligned to consumers' various budgets and style preferences. Right, I get it. Broken apostrophe key. Happens all the time. Now, aligned to budgets and style, preferences, whatever. Is that how it's done? In other news, practicality, reliability, customer support and resale value no longer appear to matter. Okay. Next, reviewing over 400 new models that went on sale during 2023. That is bullshit. Cars work like this, okay? You get the make, then the model, then the variant. They're talking about models. Over 400 new models. Corolla is a model, for example. Out here in objective reality, I could count only 333 fucking models available in Australia. I took out the trucks and the buses and I left in the utes and the vans, okay? There's 293 models of cars and SUVs plus 40 models of light commercial. I took two minibuses out of the light commercials, but I counted them. I did it twice, okay? Not that hard. And most of them didn't go, quote, on sale in 2023. Most of them were already here and being sold, okay? Now, sure, you can publish over 400 
unwatchable reviews of cars. And yay, if you do. But you cannot review over 400 models on sale in Australia in 2023 because there are only fucking 333 of them. So that is simply not possible. And Drive is supposed to be A, experts about cars, and B, experts with words and what the fuck they actually mean. Three short years ago, we introduced the first fully electric category into the Drive Car of the Year, which comprised of just three models. Gotta stop you right there, Mr. Half Thingo. I, I know you're the boss, okay? I respect that. And I know you're a bean counting scuba diver from way back, but you're running a publishing shop, dude. You could at least get the language right. Maybe by, I don't know, running it past an actual journo, if you can find one. If you had a category and just three models of car were in it, you may say the category comprised three models. You might alternatively say the category consisted of three models. But you may not say the category comprised of three models. That's just gibberish, dude. It makes the whole show look like chimpanzees with broadband. Personal opinion. It's the kind of mortal fucking sin with words that sees you drowning in a deluge of high volume opprobrium from the chief sub-editor from way across the room back in the good old days. I see people all the time in the limelight, okay? And they're trying to be more sophisticated than they actually are. And it always falls over. Like, dude, I used to wear, incredibly enough, a suit and a tie on YouTube. And all it achieved was me looking like a proper corporate criminal. So I changed for the better. And now, look at how fucking trustworthy I appear. And here we are in 2024 with not only a market growth of around 90,000 EVs sold in 2023, but with an EV taking out both the overall award and all top three finalist positions. So, if we just leave the shit grammar to one side, that statement is dodgy, okay? A market growth of around 90,000 EVs sold, unquote. It makes no sense. Growth and sales are different things. Dudes, come on. 87,000-ish EVs were sold in 2023, but the growth was about 54,000. The numbers are 87,217 in total and 53,807 for the growth, okay? That's versus 2022, obviously, like year on year. Just pick one, growth or sales, and talk about that. Like, you're supposed to be the freaking experts. The EV9 presents the future that families are looking for. Big Jimbo Ward there drives director of content, steering the ship, the head of content. No word, of course, on the torso, neck, or the limbs, but James is the cranium of content at Drive. He's a damn good talker, too. Like, he gets up so often at 4am just to see his head appear on the Today Show. Pro tip, Jimbo. It's not worth it, dude. Nobody you care about is watching. Like, nobody. That's why the next segment is always something like, Up next, pet psychics. What's your cat really thinking? Actually, that's not a joke. I did a motoring segment on Mornings with Kerry Ann on Nine of like a billion years ago. And that was, word for fucking word, her promo to the following segment. Like after the ad break, we're going to do that. And I remember thinking, Jesus H. Rotten Crotch, what am I doing here? Nobody I care about is watching. Like, Kerry Ann is very nice, however. <laughs> Where were we? Anyway, as a thought experiment on the future that families are allegedly looking for, let's get a thousand representative Australian families in a stadium and ask them for a show of hands. Who's actually looking for an electric vehicle that costs between 105 and 130,000 bucks drive away? 
how many fucking hands do you suppose might go up? Like 20 families or 10 or maybe five out of a thousand. We could ask them who's doing all they can right now to cut costs so they can keep the roof over their fucking heads and the lights on and food on the table. Might get a few more pinkies aloft with that one. Mr Ward went on to make comments about the vehicle being, quote, silent, which is factually incorrect, as well as, quote, clean, and I'd love to see the life cycle analysis on that one, dude, especially if charged off baseload power overnight. He also said, quote, cost effective, which is, of course, nonsense, at least as I see it. Nobody with 130 grand to spend on a car has a fuck to give about cost effectiveness. It's irrelevant. I get that you have to trowel it on with these mass debatery awards, but as I see it, cost effectiveness is just bullshit at that price point. I just priced the replacement tires for an EV9, okay? They're 28540R21s on the fully loaded EV9, the GT line, okay? Continentals or Pirellis in that size are going to be roughly 500 bucks a corner. And you're going to be replacing them often, dude, like two grand a set because of the ridiculous curb weight of that car. If you're at an EV charger like EV i.e. one of those 350 kilowatt DC fast chargers on the highway, if you can find one. If you are nearly flat and you need, say, 90 kilowatt hours to get your sorry ass home, that's going to cost you about 66 bucks, which you can certainly afford because you just dropped 130 grand on a car. So no problem. According to EV Database, Real world range on the highway, cold weather, in that EV9 GT line, which is a very nice car, but it's only going to be about 305 kilometres because of the way all those factors militate against the electric drivetrain, okay? The same trip in a Carnival diesel is going to be 42 bucks versus about 66 bucks in the EV9, which costs 60 grand more. So ask yourself, does that make it cost effective or relatively fucking expensive? And yeah, I agree. I did cherry pick that. Highway running is the worst case for an EV, especially in winter. But highway operation is where you use those fast chargers routinely. That's a given. Electricity is going to be cheaper than diesel around town, but the vehicle costs 60 grand more up front, which is an absurd place from which to make spurious imputations about cost effectiveness. Cars are principally transportation. Cost effective means effective in relation to their cost. Pretty difficult, therefore, I would argue, to make an EV9 seem cost effective. It seems like a very expensive way to procure transportation to me. This is the car that will set the tone for the next generation of Australian family cars, making it a true game changer for buyers. Jimbo again there, steering, directing, whatever. The EV9 is over five metres long and it weighs significantly more than a Toyota Hilux GR Sport. Many pro-environment, pro-EV, inner city, lefty, greeny, vegan cyclist types often deride vehicles such as fully loaded dual cab Hiluxes as being, quote, big, heavy gas guzzlers. And as such, they opine, not without some objective justification, I must say, that such vehicles, quote, have no place in our cities. Now, inconveniently, in the domain of facts, an EV9 is as big as that Hilux, roughly, and it is 600 kilos heavier, the GT line is at least, and obviously it drinks electricity as opposed to diesel, but on the big heavy gas guzzler front, you've got to score the EV9 2.5 out of 3, haven't you? The extra half point being because it's so fucking heavy. 
Is this actually setting the tone for the, quote, next generation of Australian family cars? Not just the next generation of family EVs, but cars generally. Like, dude, is it? If you are that EV9 owner with your own three-phase 11-kilowatt wall box and you charge up overnight on the eastern seaboard, I'm going to make a few assumptions on this one, like one kilo of CO2 emitted per kilowatt hour for coal-fired baseload power. That's a figure from reneweconomy.com.au, and it seems reasonable. You open the fridge door at midnight, okay? Those photons proudly brought to you by coal. You charge up your EV, same deal, dude. EV database says the EV9 big battery has 96 kilowatts of usable capacity and will go 610 k's in the city in mild weather, real world. So I'm not making it look intentionally shit, okay? I'm just not. These are real world conditions, mild weather, in the city where EVs are relatively efficient. If you crunch all those numbers together through the prism of La Principia and get Mr. Newton's approval on that one, what falls out of the arse of your calculations is 157 grams of CO2 per kilometre in your EV9 charged up with baseload power overnight. 157 the Hilux GR Sport, 213 grams of CO2 per K. So if Chris Bowen introduces his ute tax, like the so-called fuel efficiency standard, and a person shifts from a Hilux GR Sport to a zero emission EV9, there's going to be roughly a 25% reduction in net CO2, which to me just doesn't seem enough. If you buy a Kia Sorento GT line diesel, A, it's about half the fucking price, and B, the combined CO2 number is 159 grams per K versus like 157 on a coal-fired EV9. This hardly seems like a triumph for the planet or cost-effectiveness. Frankly, I think this is really just another bullshit expedient car of the year choice from a commercially motivated organisation that's out of touch with actual car buyers. And I say this because editorially, Drive's position on EVs appears quite transient, malleable, negotiable, whatever. See, they did this fairly unwatchable four-way so-called fireside chat on EVs sponsored by BHP just seven months ago. So I'm not cherry picking something that's ancient history, okay? This is current. It's in from like about July last year. When asked, quote, for those out there contemplating purchasing an EV, what are your words? Mr. Ward Responded. And hybrids are good. Like, yo, know, don't discount a hybrid. Hybrids are good. That's hybrids are good. That's my thing. I'm getting it tattooed <laughs> down my arm. Just to be crystal on this, Mr. Ward's advice to would be EV buyers in approximately July last year was if you are contemplating the purchase of an EV, hybrids are good. Not only that, he told the world just a few seconds later that he was, quote, getting it tattooed down his arm. The words hybrids are good. Now, that was said in jest. I get that. We all do. Nobody expects to see him rocking the actual tattoo. But the underlying sentiment seems to speak to his entrenched preference for hybrids over EVs, presumably because they are superior for Australian driving conditions. And all of them made comments broadly to this effect earlier in that video. I'll link to it in the description. You can watch it and bump up their numbers a bit if you want. And I would agree with Big Jimbo on all of that. Hybrids are good, wholeheartedly. Hybrids are better than EVs for the majority of driving applications in Australia. I don't believe I'm misrepresenting their position in any way here, having endured the entire 25-minute miracle insomnia cure twice. I'm two of those 
massive 1,800 views, dudes, but no need to thank me because I clicked away from the ads at the first opportunity. Seven months ago, Jimbo Content Cranium, his advice for would-be EV, EV buyers was hybrids are good, meaning superior, meaning buy a hybrid instead. What changed? There's a lot of terrain between hybrids are good over here and EV9 is the future for Australian families, isn't there? Are we to believe that the EV9 with its 600 or 700 kilo battery is such an evolution for EVs that Jimbo needs to redo his tattoo? If these overweight resource intensive abominations actually are the tone of the next generation of Australian family cars. I would argue that the planet is fucked. Unless God does rip through the clouds in that jumpsuit and go 100% Thanos on humanity's ass, as they say in America. This tattoo redo style turnaround, right, from hybrids are good to EVs of the future for Australian families, seems both inconsistent and highly expedient to me. But realistically, nobody should give a shit what I think, okay? Because I'm a nobody. What matters is, what do you think? Has Drive convinced you? A car like an EV9 for your family next? Should I perhaps put you down for a couple? Is this just another commercially motivated bullshit car of the year with little to no underlying substance designed to cash in and grab a few headlines. Kia will certainly milk it for all it's worth. Those rivers of advertising gold will certainly flow. Or have I missed the point completely? And pretty soon, cars like the EV9 will be the HQ Holdens of 21st century Australia. I'm going to leave that to you to work out. Let me know in the comments and thanks very much for watching.